Turn with me to Genesis chapter 34. And let's pray before we begin. Oh dear, dear, oh dear gracious God, you are indeed our, our rock and our redeemer. Dear God, you called us when we were still sinners dead in our trespasses, and you brought us to life, oh God, by your grace, by your mercy. And I thank you for that. Dear God, I ask that you guide us as we study your word this morning, that you give me clarity of speech and give us all ears to hear that we might understand your word and grow in our faith today. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now to begin this sermon, we have to, uh, I have to uh, give a little preface that there is a little bit of sensitive content, which you can see up here on the stage. But what I want you to see is that the Bible, once again, it tells the story as it is because... God is there in the midst of all the difficulty and all the challenging situations. But what we've seen so far, where we left off last week, Jacob went to meet his brother Esau and was terrified at doing so. But then we see the wonderful grace of God, how he changed Esau's heart so that Esau actually greeted his brother with kindness instead of sadness or hostility. And it was a beautiful picture of God's grace. Even though Jacob, in a sense, deserved his brother's wrath, or perhaps not deserved, but, but Jacob fully believed that Esau was going to come and kill him, but God delivered Jacob and made Esau kind towards him and compassionate. But as we're going to see in all of these Old Testament stories, as I mentioned from the very beginning, we will see a great work where God does a mighty work by his grace, but then, like that, the people end up back into sin. It's amazing how it works, and it's sad, but it points towards our need for the ultimate Savior, who is Jesus, okay? Because we're going to see Jacob, Jacob sort of has some inaction here in this story that we're going to see today, and we're going to see Jacob's imperfection just as, you know, Abraham had imperfections, Isaac had imperfections. We're going to see that because it's good for us to see that because we are imperfect, but there is only one who has come who was truly truly perfect, and his name was Jesus. So all of these stories in the Old Testament point up to our need for a great Savior, a perfect Savior. Jacob wasn't that Savior, but Jacob is is a sinner like us who got got God called out of his sinful estate and brought to life and transformed. So let's look at the story starting in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 34. It says, Dinah, Leah's daughter, whom she bore to Jacob, went out to see some of the young women in the area. When Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, a prince of the region, saw her, he took her and raped her. Dinah was out to look for friendship. She was looking to be friends with some of the young ladies in the area. And this man who was, you know, the the town, so little thing on Genesis, the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch, they were all written down by Moses. So they were written down on paper long after they actually happened. They were They were told verbally before that. That's how the tradition passed down. But Moses was the one to write them down. The town that this was actually in was called Shechem. So the namesake was actually likely from this prince. Either he was named after the town or the town was named after him. But he was a prince of the region and he saw this woman and he wanted her and he took her without her consent or anyone's consent. He greatly sinned against her. He became infatuated with Dinah, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young girl and spoke tenderly to her. Get me this girl as a wife, he told his father. And Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but since his sons were with his livestock in the field, he remained silent until they returned. So the stage is already set for our story for today because we see in this sinful world, something sinful happened that this, this innocent girl of Jacob's family was taken by a prince of the, the surrounding land and mistreated and defiled. Yet Jacob felt powerless, says he remained silent. He didn't know what to do. We find very often in our lifetime, in our modern day, that life seems to throw us situations that we do not know how to respond to, right? Right? There are ethical dilemmas. There's a a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who's one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called Ethics that he said, there are truly no ethics other than Jesus Christ, basically. Go to him. That's your ethics. Because you can think of, you know, are we supposed to lie? No. But do you think, you know, uh, biblical example, Rahab, when she 
hid the Israeli spies when they were coming in to conquer the land? Do you think she did wrong by lying to our people? No. So see, there are, there are ethical you know, dilemmas at times, right? Uh, likewise, if it were in the Holocaust and people were harboring some Jewish families in their attic and the, you know, the Nazi soldiers came up and said, hey, are you hiding people here? Do you think it would be a sin to lie to them and say no? Huh? Sometimes ethics are difficult because the question here is, how should Jacob respond based on what was done to his daughter? Obviously, what was done to Dinah was sinful, but Jacob didn't know what to do. He felt powerless, and so he remained silent. Meanwhile, Shechem's father, Hamor, came to speak with Jacob. Jacob's sons returned from the field when they heard about the incident and were deeply grieved and angry, for Shechem had committed an outrage against Israel by raping Jacob's daughter, and such a thing should not be done. Amen? Amen. Hamor said to Jacob's sons, My son Shechem is strongly attracted to your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Live with us. The land is before you. Settle here. Move about and acquire property in it. To think of the nerve of this man to seriously come and ask for, for Jacob's daughter as a wife. And then he tries to, you know, bargain with him and says, Yeah, you know, you, the land will be ours. You can marry our daughters and it'll all, everything will be great for you. Later on, when the Israelites would come into the promised land, what did God say for them to do with the people who were already there? Kill them. Now, is killing generally a good ethical decision? No, but God gave the command, but part of the reason he gave that command is stuff like this was common practice. This prince wanted this girl, so he went and he took her for himself. He didn't care about her consent. You have to understand the sinfulness that was going on in the world. God never called for his people to go into a people and just become part of that people. We are to be in the world, but not part of the world. Does that make sense? So sometimes there are movements in the church today, which this isn't what most of the story is about, but it, it's worth mentioning. There are movements in the church that say, hey, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist. You know, we're all serving the same God and we should just all get along. The Bible never gives that account. Whenever the Israelites would try to serve God and other gods, God was never, ever, ever happy with that. He called that idolatry. He punished them when that was the case. They were never meant to fully assimilate into the pagan peoples that were around them. You're going to, you know, be a good citizen, right? But you're not going to do things the way the world's going to do. You're not part of the world if you are a Christian. You are a different creation from some of the people who are around you in society, right? You know, I heard, and this is the only political thing I'll say today, hopefully. Yeah. I heard there's a, there's a presidential candidate who said that, you know, if he gets elected and churches don't preach doctrines that basically go with the common line of thinking as far as marriage goes, they will lose their tax-exempt status. Be prepared. I can tell you if, uh, if we have to lose our tax-exempt status for it, fine, tax us. You know, but, but there's a desire for the world to say, hey, you come in and you be part of us. You bow down to us. Your church needs to bow down to the state. That's been going on since about then. You know, Israel, they were called by God, but here Hamor says, come in, be part of our people. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brothers, grant me this favor and I'll give you whatever you say. Demand of me a high compensation and gift. I'll give you whatever you ask me. Just give me the girl, give the girl to be my wife. Imagine what kind of position this would put you in. Because these people around him, you know, they have been peaceable to Jacob so far. And if they were to tell them no, you know, they would likely try to come and take her by force. So let's look at what they do. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. We cannot do this thing, they said to them. Giving our sister to an uncircumcised man is a disgrace to us. We will agree with you only on this condition. If all your males are circumcised as we are, then we will give you our daughters, take your daughters for ourselves, live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Their words seemed good to Hamer and his son Shechem. The young man did not delay doing this because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most important in all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and spoke to the men there. 
These men are peaceful toward us, they said. Let them live in our land and move about in it, for indeed the region is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as our wives and give our daughters to them. But the men will agree to live with us and be one people only on this condition, if all our men are circumcised as they are. Won't their livestock, their possessions, and all their animals become ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will live with us. All the able-bodied men listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and all the able-bodied men were circumcised. Now, before we get to the next part of the story, let's understand, this is, this is often the mindset of the world. And look at how this has played out throughout history, because it's very interesting. Christianity started during the Roman Empire, correct? And at the time, Rome was a very pagan empire. They served tons of gods. They served the sun, and, and the, you know, they, but they had a, a practice. In fact, the Romans were not the only ones who had this practice, but when they would go into conquer a kingdom, they would sort of adopt that area's gods as their gods and give them Roman names and pray to those gods for victory. Okay, that's how, you know, uh, if you learned about Greek mythology growing up or Roman mythology, Zeus, you know, when the Romans conquered the Greeks, they adopted Zeus and named him Jupiter. You know, the names of our planets are actually after Roman gods, uh, if you didn't know that. Uh, But they would go into these different civilizations and they would incorporate their religion into Romanism, so to speak. Ironically enough, what... What's the full name of what we call the Catholic Church? The Roman Catholic Church. What you'll see a lot, which this isn't bash on Catholicism hour, but what you've seen throughout the history of the Catholic Church is the Roman part of the Catholic Church has also spread. When they would go to these different pagan areas, even in the name of Christianity, they would tear down the pagan temples and they would build a cathedral on top of them. And whatever, you know, the the gods or goddesses were of that pagan culture, they would give that a a Christian name. They would give it, and they would give it sainthood status. It's amazing, the Roman practices continued on. So all I will encourage you to do, look into some of the different saints and stuff like that. If, If you, you know, have been into the Catholic church or have friends who are in it, look into some of that and, and find out if it comes from this or if it comes from more of the Roman side. That's all I'll say about that. But anywho, that has been a way that many world empires have operated. In the United States, we have freedom of religion, right? So long as your religion, you know, works within the state's laws. That's how the Persian Empire worked, too. That's how the Greek Empire, for the most part, worked. That's how world empires survive. The end times, when that happens, when there is this one world government, which I fully believe will happen... Okay? It'll be the same sort of thing. Oh, you can worship whoever you want as long as you're following the guidelines set out by the government. Okay? I'm getting off my topic a little bit, but that mindset was here at this time. He said, hey, yeah, we'll let them, we'll do what they want us to do because look at what we'll get out of it. We'll get their livestock, their possessions, their animals. Do political parties ever try to use your religion to uh, get your vote? And then don't do what they're actually saying that they're going to do. Guys, that's this. That's this right here. It's here all the way back in Genesis. Okay? Yeah, you bring, yeah we'll do this for them. We'll, we'll say that we're like them so that we can have all their livestock, their possessions, all that stuff. And they'll come live with us. So we see often new societies, they're very welcoming to Christianity for a time. But then when Christianity stops agreeing with what they want to accomplish... Christianity starts to get kicked out, right? Has that happened in our culture? Like I said, I'm getting off my topic here, but I think it's important stuff, all right? But understand, Jacob had, Jacob's sons deceived them. It says, on the third day, oh, the third day showing up again. When they were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords, went into the unsuspecting city and killed every male. They took Hamer and his son Shechem with their swords, took Dinah from Shechem's house and went away. Jacob's other sons came to the slaughter and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. So they went into the city and they killed everyone, all the men for what had been done to their sister. They took their sheep, cattle, donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. They captured all their possessions, children and wives, and plundered everything in the houses. 
So they deceived the people and said, yeah, if you do this, we'll be part of you. And then while they were weak, uh, for, for obvious reasons, they went in and they slaughtered all of them. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me, making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. We are few in number. If they united against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they answered, should he have treated our sister like a prostitute? So we see this incredibly challenging ethical dilemma that they were put in. Something was clearly done wrong to Dinah. It was very disrespectful and sinful. But Jacob was angry at how his sons responded. It's a challenging thing, right? Because should there have been justice done? Absolutely. But how they went about it, Jacob later, when he is at his deathbed, he's going to announce blessings and curses, ultimately, on his sons. And he says about Levi and Simeon, who led the charge, he said, you were too swift to shed blood. Because they went in, because they didn't just hold the, you know, hold Shechem accountable for what he did. They killed every single male in the city. So they responded to sin with more sin. More so, think of this, they used the covenant, the seal of the covenant that God had given them as a deceitful military tactic. They took something that was supposed to be wholly given to them by God and used it as a trick to slaughter a village. That's sinful. What was done to Dinah was sinful, but what they did was also sinful. So we see even with God's chosen people, sometimes these situations come about. Their greatest error was they didn't wait on the Lord. If they would have just waited upon the Lord, God could have judged what had been done. Amen? But they didn't. They took matters into their own hands. Oftentimes we do the same thing, right? Someone does something wrong to us and we're quick to get right back at them. But if we would simply wait upon the Lord, God can judge sin in a far better way than we can. Because what was Jacob's complaint here? Oh no, now, since they've seen, they think that we're these murderers now because we went in and slaughtered a village, they're all going to unite and kill us. He doesn't feel safe anymore, right? And, and should he? I mean, if you were one of the neighboring villages and you saw what happened, oh, these Israelites are dangerous. We don't want them here. So then the next chapter, God said to Jacob, Get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So because of what they did, they had to pack up and move because they couldn't stick around there. They wouldn't have been safe. But this, this is probably the most interesting verse in this passage. So, so Jacob said to his family and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to the God who answered me in the day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I have gone. So it tells us a couple of things. First of all, there were foreign gods. There were idols in Jacob's camp. Do you think God liked that? Think God likes it when we have idols in our camp? Absolutely not. So they were there, yet God still called them. But, but Jacob had the desire to purify himself and his family. Say, let's get rid of all that. This is the God who's been watching out for me since I was born. This is the God I serve. Get rid of all these other gods. There's a desire for him to purify himself in that and to purify his own family. Understand, as I've said before, a lot of these stories in Genesis, when you look at the characters, you say, well, that one's a sinner. That one's immoral. That one's immoral. Okay. And if you look at a lot of things throughout history and a lot of things that were done, we would say that they were immoral understand how good God is, that he called Jacob out of this, that they were in that situation. God does not just leave us to die. Amen? When we were dead in our sins and trespasses, he calls us out. But it is a long and winding road to get victory over sin. And that is the road we are on as believers. So we must... First of all, we must never get high and mighty and say, well, I've got it all figured out and I'm a good person now, but that person over there is sinful. That's why the Bible talks about not judging people. Because even though there were idols in Jacob's own household, God saves Jacob. He delivers him out of it and calls him out of it. Amen? So likewise, there are things 
that I did early on in my Christian life that I look back on and I'm like, I can't believe I did that. But do you think if God showed you every single thing that you did wrong all at once, that you could just continue on? It would be overwhelming, right? So we find that in God's plan of salvation, he shows you little by little, day by day, a little bit more, a little bit more. Hey, what's, what's going on there? Why are you doing that? Well, I don't know. Well, why'd you say that to that person? That was rude. You're right, it was. And he shows us little by little. And then when you start to figure that out and you're like, okay, yeah, things are right. Then he shows you a little bit more. That's, that's sanctification. That's what God is doing to Jacob. Purify yourselves. Get rid of these other gods. They're not any good for you. Then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. When they set out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel and the land of Canaan. So they fled from where they were because of, you know, even though wrong was done to them, they also did wrong, and so they had to flee. But God protected them in their fleeing. Jacob built an altar there and called the place God of Bethel because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. So Jacob then worships, okay? There are lots of examples when we read these in the Bible where we say, oh, they built an altar, okay, cool. That is a, an important thing of worship when they decide to build an altar somewhere. It's for remembering and for glorifying God because he delivered them just like he had delivered Jacob from his brother. Deborah, the one who had nursed and raised Rebekah, died and was buried under the oak south of Bethel. So Jacob named it Oak of Weeping. Rebekah was Jacob's mom, so this would have been Rebekah's nurse. So it would have been sort of like a mother to Rebekah and a grandmother to Jacob. So it's just, she passed away there. But they had to continue on. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, you will no longer be named Jacob, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. So that had happened in last week, right? We had seen that in a previous chapter, but it's reaffirmed here. Why does God do that? Because God knows that we need that. We need to hear things more than once sometimes, amen? So God repeats it to him again. Not only is he gonna repeat that, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, indeed an assembly of nations, will come from you, and kings will descend from you. I will give to you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, and I will give the land to your future descendants. He repeats another covenant that he had already given to Abraham and Isaac. Why do you think he chose to repeat it then? Jacob was likely terrified. They had just fled for their lives, basically, from these surrounding villages, and God wanted to remind him, no, this isn't going to be your end. You're going to have kings come from you. The very king of the, the earth, the very savior of the world was going to come from Jacob's descendants. Then God withdrew from him at the place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him, a stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. And Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. So we see once again, he sets up a marker to remember, hey, yeah, I can remember here that God says, you guys ever set up markers to remind yourself of stuff? You have a calendar or something? It's good to have that because what you can find is we can be incredibly forgetful, amen? I find myself more and more forgetful by the day, okay? It's part of life, but it's amazing how, I, I, as a minister on a Sunday, I can feel full of the Holy Spirit and walking in Christ and ready to teach you guys and give you what God has given me. And then on Monday, I can feel really distant from God. It's amazing how that works. I don't think I'm alone in that, but that's part of the human condition because these emotions we have, emotions are a beautiful thing, but emotions aren't always good for telling us what the truth is. You know, you can feel things that aren't true, right? You know, I can, oh, well, Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Might as well go eat worms, you know, right? You can feel that way, and that can be completely untrue. So the, he sets these reminders there so he can remember, hey, God said this. God very clearly said this on that day. Because there are going to be times that it feels like the world's crashing in around you. You guys ever read the book of Psalms? Most of those are David writing these when he is at his worst time of distress. You know, when he's fleeing from Saul or he's fleeing from Absalom. 
You know, when David was at his absolute lowest, he would pray to God and these Psalms would come out. He'd write them down because, and well, most of them would end up being prophetic and talking about Jesus. I don't know if he knew that when he was writing it or not, but he was writing those things in the midst of his distress to remember how good God was, even though things around him weren't so good. God likes to remind us that he is good even when things aren't good, amen? He doesn't just leave us there. He teaches us, he draws us out. But this also prepared him for what's gonna come next. They set out from Bethel. When there was still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and her labor was difficult. Remember, Rachel was the wife that Jacob really loved. You know, he married Rachel and Leah, but Rachel was the one he really wanted. So during her difficult labor, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. With her last breath, for she was dying, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow. Benjamin means son of my right hand. So his wife, shortly after this, died. God spoke to him right before that because God had to prepare him for what was about to happen. His wife, whom he loved, died. However, this is also actually a little bit prophetic because, well, let's read the next two verses too. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker on her grave. It is the marker at Rachel's grave to this day. So who else do we know who, who there's some significance with Bethlehem? Jesus, he was born there, right? Okay, there were actually two Bethlehems in Israel. Bethlehem means village of bread, just so you know. Uh, Bethlehem Ephrata was where Jesus was born. What happened shortly after Jesus was born? What did Herod do? He sent an order to kill all the kids. Okay, in Matthew chapter 2, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. So then we look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 15, this is what the Lord says. A voice was heard in Ramah, a lament with bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. See how the entire text works together. This story happened, you know, it says where Rachel's buried and there's a marker where she's buried at in Bethlehem or right outside of Bethlehem. And then in Jeremiah, you get the story that, you know, well, why is Rachel weeping? Well, what does that mean? Well, then in Matthew, when this actually happened, they would know exactly what the prophet Jeremiah was talking about. Isn't that interesting how God's word works? So you can see all the pieces working together. Genesis, Jerem- you know, the history, the prophets, the gospel, all working together. It's interesting how that works. But anyway, that's just... The goal of what we're doing here, guys... I know some of these stories are sort of drawn out and long, but the purpose is you have to understand the foundation of this faith that we live in. That's the purpose. You have to understand the foundation because as I mentioned in the early service, you know, if, if you have a house with a bad foundation, you're better off starting over most of the time, right? You know, when Kelsey and I were house shopping, the first thing you got to check out is the foundation of the house. The foundation is rough. It's going to cost you a ton of money to try to fix it. Find a house with a good foundation. So this is us building the foundation. We have to understand this God and and man and how the two interact, basically. So then, after they buried Rachel, it says, Israel set out again and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben, which is his oldest son, went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about it. So what we're seeing here, and what we'll really lean into next week, the story is starting to shift from Jacob to Jacob's children. And so far, Jacob's children are not off to a great start, right? We have Simeon and Levi doing what they did. Now Reuben goes in and sleeps with his father's concubine. Reuben's the oldest. Simeon and Levi, I believe, are the next two oldest. So we're already seeing they're not doing that great of stuff here. And then it's going to reiterate who all his sons are. Jacob had 12 sons. Leah's sons were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. 
Rachel's sons were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's slave Bilhah were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's slave Zilpah were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. The only one who wasn't born in Paddan Aram was actually Benjamin. He was born in the promised land. The rest of them were born outside of it. But understand, as we transition, in the midst of all the mercy and grace God is pouring out, sin is still coming in too, right? As I said at the beginning, this is the whole thing. This was always, always, always pointing forward to Jesus. Because with Noah, he was righteous, his son sinned. Okay? Then with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we see God delivers him, he calls him out, but then sin is still there. Dealing with this sin problem took the very death of Jesus to actually fix. That's what we have to see. Because these guys, God was literally talking to them and calling them, and they still did these sinful things. But yet, there's something very significant about these 12 boys here, these 12 men. What's significant about them? Their names are used a lot in Scripture, right? Because these are the 12 tribes of Israel. There are going to be direct consequences for the things that they do. For example, for Simeon and Levi, their judgment was that they would not have their own tribal allotment once they entered the promised land. We'll see that when we get to the very end of Jacob's story. But the Levites, they don't have, if you look at all of Israel's history, they never had a place that was just the Levites, right? However, the Levites ended up doing something good, and so they became the priests. But they were throughout all that. They never had their own section of land. So God took something that they did that was wrong and still used it for his good and for their good. Reuben's also going to have, I mean, we'll get to the consequence, so I won't jump ahead of that. But understand, these stories are how we got to where we're at today. It hasn't been perfect and easy, but Jesus Christ came in and did what no one else before him could do. Because his followers showed a victory over sin that could not be seen in this time and could not be seen in the time of Israel as a kingdom. His followers showed victory, victory, victory. And that victory is extended out to today. Did you know you can have victory over sin? You know, there are some who say, oh, well, we just, we all sin every day in thought, word, and deed. That does not have to be true. You can have victory over sin through Jesus Christ. You don't have to live a defeated life. They were bound by their sin. Then, and they're going to sin because that's the nature that was in them. But Jesus is the prime person. He is the one who came in and fixed the problem in us. But let's finish that story. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. A couple things to understand on that in closing. First of all, Isaac lived 180 years. What a long life. But remember when Jacob was originally sent off some, you know, 20 years before that, Rebekah sent him off because Isaac was about to die, right? They thought Isaac was going to die, right? And then Esau was like, well, as soon as he dies, you know, we're going to mourn and then I'm going to kill, and then I'm going to kill Jacob. He was gone. For, he lived for 20 more years and then some, because 20 years was just the time until he came back to the promised land. We don't get a passage of time between then and now. So sometimes the world will tell you you don't have much time left, right? But who actually gets to decide how long you live? God does, okay? So it doesn't matter what the reports say. If God wants to take you home today, he's going to take you home today. If he wants to give you another 50 years on this earth, he can do that, Amen. But we see Isaac's story ends after 180 years and he had a beautiful blessing. Guys, there is a wonderful, you know, death doesn't always seem like a blessing to us, right? But there is a, there is a peaceable way to die and Isaac was able to do that. But my former pastor, he would always say he wants to die healthy, which sounds like an oxymoron. But he was able to die a peaceable death. There was often in, in you know, ancient society, if you were able to die a peaceable death, that was a great blessing because there were, I mean, people would come in and, you know, there was lots of wars all the time and Isaac was able to die in peace. So what we're going to see next week, the story is going to shift from Jacob to Joseph. Okay. These people are known as the patriarchs, the fathers of faith. 
And Joseph, he's going to be a very interesting character for lots of reasons. And God is going to use Joseph's tragedy for Joseph's good and for the good of the whole family, just like he does so many times through the word. So I hope you continue with this. I know, I know, I know. Sometimes, like I said, these stories, they can be hard to read when you're reading Genesis, but I promise there's so much value in them. I hope you're seeing that, okay? So closing up, I've said that already once, but that's the biggest lie I'll ever hear from a pastor. But I'd rather lie on that than not say what God would have me to say, amen? Amen. Okay, so closing up, they were put at the beginning of the story in an impossible situation. In this world, you are going to have incredibly challenging and difficult situations. The gospel does not tell you that you're going to have an easy life. If a preacher tells you your life is just going to be easy and free of troubles, they have not read the book because oftentimes the most faithful had the most troubles in this world. But God gives grace to deal with that. We don't have to solve all of our own problems. Take them to the Lord. Amen? Amen. And he gives you everything you need. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, for you are good. And Lord, in the midst of all the sin and all the difficulty and all the trials we go through, you are still God through it all. And I praise you for that. For Lord, you have taken me out of my sins, you've taken me out of my struggles and my difficulties, and yet I'm still here because of your grace. And Lord, you change me and you give me encouragement that I might grow in you and that I might learn to handle situations better for my good and for your glory. Please continue to be with us as we go throughout the rest of our service and let us do everything in a manner worthy of the calling we've received. Ask in Jesus' great name, amen.